Psalms of Ascents, and if you'll bow with me, we'll be prepared. Father, we do thank you for the day and the blessings you've given us. We thank you for being with us and guiding us and keeping us safe. Thank you, Father, for this time we have to gather together with uh, people of like mind and kindred faith, and Father, a desire to worship and glorify you. We thank you, Father, for the word that you've given, that we might carry it about with us, but more importantly, Father, that we might hide it in our minds and our thoughts and our heart, that, Father, it would be quick upon our lips, that, Father, we would be a testimony to you and your grace and your mercy and your kindness. May we even day, this day, Father, look at uh, uh, Psalm 131, a psalm of David, and consider all that there is to think about and understand about you in this psalm. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray it would be beneficial to us, that our hearts would be encouraged. Father, that we would desire to minister your word to others, that we would, Father, desire to be a testimony of all the good that you have wrought in this world and of your salvation through Jesus, your Son. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, we are again looking at a psalm of ascents. Uh, that is a psalm that was sung by the pilgrims, the Hebrew pilgrims, as they traveled to Jerusalem. Uh, they would be traveling up to Jerusalem, God's holy mountain, God's holy city, the temple of the Lord. And there they would be offering their sacrifices of thanksgiving before the Lord. This was prescribed that they do so every year. Uh, they would go up for the Feast of Tabernacles. They would go up for the Feast of First Fruits. They would go up for the Passover Feast. And the desire on their heart was to worship a holy and righteous God, to make sacrifices to Him, to understand that uh, He is the one who has provided a Redeemer and a Savior to come. And they looked forward to that. We, of course, look back to Jesus Christ and his coming, that he was the redeemer, the savior of, of his people. And it was he who was to come to save their, his people from their sins. And that is something that we should remember. And we should come to our worship place to gather together and show appreciation to the Lord God for what he has done. He has wrought salvation for us through Jesus, his son. This is Psalm 131. It's described as a psalm of or by David. Uh, he wrote four of the Psalms of Ascents, Psalm 121, 124, this psalm, and one, uh, Psalm 133. Uh, that being said, uh, it's not a long psalm, but we've got lots to, lots to cover, lots to cover. But understanding that it's a psalm of David, we need to remember what might come to mind to the people as they sang this song, understanding David penned it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they may be remembering Je or, sorry, David as a shepherd boy, uh, the youngest son of Jesse, who was out in the fields wa watching his uh, father's sheep, protecting them, guarding them, keeping them secure from all outside predators. It would be David that they would remember that would declare that he killed a bear and he killed a lion that came to seek out and, uh, and to harm the sheep. It would be David that was called by his father to take supplies to his brothers in the army of Saul as they went up against the Philistines. Uh, a young man. A young man, but very confident in, in God and confident in what he could do. And Jesse being confident in him. He sent him to the armies of uh, Saul, to his brothers, to deliver supplies. And as he arrived there, we read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, Goliath the Philistine came out says that he came out for 40 days. He came out every morning and every evening and, and taunted the army of the Lord God. And David was incensed that he would do so and no one would stand against him. He was, he was uh, confounded that the armies of Saul would not do something about this Philistine. 
We know that David, with a sling and a stone, slew Goliath. And the army rose up behind him and slew the Philistine army and chased them out of the area. It was David who was taken to Saul's court after that, uh, uh, proving an uh, understanding that he was a musician. He played the, lu- the lyre or the harp. And uh, Saul, who would uh, have sometimes have a disquieting spirit as the Lord withdrew his presence from Saul, uh, they would call David to play music, to comfort Saul. It was in Saul's court that Saul attempted to kill David twice, becoming jealous of the way that the people were acknowledging David as a warrior, as one who slew the armies that came up against Israel. Uh, you know, they would, they would sing the song that uh, David uh, has killed his ten thousands and Saul has killed his thousands. Saul became more and more enraged and he he thought in his mind that David was opposing him, trying to garner support. Jonathan, Saul's son, warned David, told him to leave and to flee, that Saul was determined in his heart to kill David. And we know that, that David traveled among the wilderness and in the hills and and even amongst his enemies, to flee from the presence of Saul. And in all of that, we understand and know that David had been anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the king of Israel. But he would not raise his hand against God's anointed king. David did what was right, even though it was difficult for him and even dangerous for him, as Saul pursued him through the wilderness and through the hills and the mountains. David at least twice had opportunity to kill Saul, and he refused to do so, instead just presenting evidence that he had been overstanding over the very form of Saul, had opportunity to slay him, but did not. David did what was right in God's eyes, determined not to oppose God's will or God's timing. David knew he had been anointed to be king over Israel, but he knew that that was in God's timing. And he waited for the Lord. He did what was right. He did uh, everything that he could that Saul ordered him to do. And he waited for the Lord for that time when he would raise him to power. Let's read Psalm 131. Uh, <clears throat> psalm 131, a psalm of trust in the Lord, a song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve my things, myself in things of, in great matters, or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Uh, The beginning of this psalm starts out, O Lord. Uh, The word Lord there is Yahweh, uh, later translated as Jehovah. It is the uh, reference to the Lord and the name of the Lord that implies that he is the loving, loyal, covenant-keeping God of Israel, the maker of heaven and earth. He is the Lord God of Israel, his special chosen people. Uh, Actually, Yahweh is found in every one of the Psalms of Ascents. There's a call to the Lord God, the God of Israel. Uh, It's even found in the last psalm of uh, ascents, uh, Psalm 134. It's found in, it only has three verses, but it's found in each of the three verses. This is is a a set of psalms that was intended for the nation to continually call out to the Lord God, to seek him as an understanding of him as the maker of heaven and earth, of a covenant-keeping loyal, loving God, says, my heart is not proud. David, under inspiration, declares that he would not have a proud heart before the Lord. How can we have a proud 
heart before the Lord. All that we have, all that we are, any ability, any gift, any strength that we have, God has provided for us. He has given to us. Proud here means to have a high or lofty or exalted thought concerning oneself. And David declares that he's not proud. He's humble before the Lord God. And we know that other scriptures, and since all scripture is written and inspired by God, it's all profitable for us to look at in terms of what God has for us to know. David declares that his heart is not proud. And we know that God tells us about pride in his scriptures. So, uh, Proverbs 16.5 says, The Lord detests all of the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. And uh, we need to understand that pride is not something that God just tolerates. God has declared he will punish those who are proud in heart. And why is that? If we're proud of our accomplishments, of what we can do, of our status or our position, we are putting ourselves in the place of God. We are not giving him the glory for what he has provided for us. We are not to be proud of heart. Proverbs 18.12 says, Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, it's haughty, it's lifted up, it's exalted. But humility, which is gentleness or meekness, comes before honor. We have a very common adage. Uh, I think you'll recognize it. that uh, declares that pride goeth before the fall. Proverbs 18.12, uh, so many of our common, everyday, common sense sayings come directly from Scripture. But we need to make sure that we are accurately uh, supporting what God says in his word. The proud of heart will not go unpunished. They go, pride goes before the fall. The, th the thought that comes to my mind is Nebuchadnezzar. It's so easy to think of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, even though he was warned in a vision, uh, given a vision of a great tree that was covering the earth and providing shade and comfort and, uh, to the animals of, of the area. It was cut down, and uh, Daniel was asked to convey the meaning of this in uh, Daniel chapter 4, verses 30 to 37. Saul walks out on his balcony, and he looks over the city of Babylon. And I did a little looking of what the city of Babylon was like at that time. And they said it covered 200 square miles. It was about the size of Chicago, Illinois, here in the United States. The walls were 90 feet high, 90 feet wide, completely around the city. That they could run uh, Herodotus, the historian, said that they could have chariot races on the top of the walls of Babylon. Uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon at one time was uh, known as uh, one of the seven wonders of the world. So it's no small thing that uh, Nebuchadnezzar could walk out on his balcony and sur survey this great city and should have been appreciative of what God had provided. And instead, in his pride, he said, Look at Babylon, which I have made. And it says, instantly, God took him down, caused him to lose his mind, to be treated even as a beast of the field, to go out and to eat grass as a beast, just as God had said in his vision that it would happen. We need to be very careful. And uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a great man, and he was a great king. He was a, had a great city. That was all gifts from God. And we need to be careful in our own lives that we are not built up at what station we have in life and the kinds of abilities that we have, the strengths that we have or the finances that we have. We need to be careful to always remember that it is the Lord God who provides these things for us. Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. 
And I like to I like to think and understand that uh, the life there is not only physical life, but it's our spiritual life. Our spiritual life comes from God. It is He who works redemption and salvation in us through Jesus Christ, His Son. James chapter four and verse six says, "God resists, or He opposes, or He is against the proud, but He gives grace." To the humble. Verse 10 in James 4 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And we know in Isaiah 66, in the second half of verse 2, it says, But to this one, and this is God speaking, to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. And we are not to be proud. We are only to glorify God for what God has provided for us. It says also in verse 1, Nor are my eyes haughty. Haughty there is an arrogant, condescending, looking down on others, considering oneself as more important or of a higher station or position than others. Uh, Naturally flows out of pride of self. Uh, If if you're proud of what you can do, if you're proud of what you have, if you're proud of... uh, the strength that you have, you tend to look at other people and go, I'm I'm better than him. I'm better than her. You become arrogant and condescending. And there's two places that I would look in scriptures to have an idea of what being haughty is or is not. In Luke chapter 10, pardon me, it's Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Uh, Other people are swindlers and unjust and adulterers or even like this tax collector standing off to the side. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I, 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 yay, 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 yay. I, Pharisee is wrapped up in all that he does, all that he has, all that he, uh, uh, his position and his status, and he's comparing himself to other people. And we are only to look to the Lord God, to focus our attention on the Lord God and to know that we have no room to be haughty or arrogant above above any others. I'm not going to do it. I had a Star Trek story. I'm going to save that. If you want to know what I was thinking, come and ask me about it. (laughs) Just doesn't seem to fit right now. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. We find the attitude that we are to have before God. Verses 3 to 8 says, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the epitome of being a humble servant of God. Who, although he existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of a man and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we know that God highly exalted Jesus Christ. Christ humbled himself, came as a man to this earth. He went to the cross for sins that were not his own, that we can stand before him dressed in a righteousness that is not our own. He was humble before the Lord. Took on the form of a bondservant. If Christ is our example, our uh, ultimate example, of the way to have, of the attitude to have in this world, we are to be everyone's bond servant. We're not to look down on anyone. We're not to be proud of ourselves. We're not to be haughty of, over others. It 
reading a lot of things between the lines here, and I haven't even gotten to the whole first verse yet. David declared, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Uh, it, was a, it was a difficult thing to consider. But uh, we have another psalm by David. It's Psalm 139. And in it, he declares what kinds of things are too difficult for him. I'm only going to read through verse 6, but there's some things to understand and know about the rest of this psalm. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou hast, dost know when I sit down and when I rise up, and thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down, and art intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before, and I have laid thy hand upon me. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. I cannot grasp it. I cannot fully understand what it is to have a God that is so intimately acquainted with everything that I do, every thought that I have, whether I'm sleeping or awake, whether I'm lying in bed or getting up or going about my way, God knows everything. He comes before. He comes after. The Lord God is ever-present. He is sovereign over all things. Verses 7 to 12 tells us that God is everywhere. And whether he's in heaven, he's below the earth, he's on the earth, he's in the midst of the sea. There's nowhere that David can go on the earth that God is not there. It says in verse 14 at the end, and my soul knows it very well. Can't grasp the idea of it necessarily. Can't understand how there can be such a being, uh, such a God. It would be everywhere, omnipresent. Verses 13 to 16. David declares that he's been fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and understand this. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, God formed you in the womb of your mother. Verse 16 says, Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written the days that were ordained for me, while there was yet not one of them. Before we were born, God knew the days of our lives. Verses 17 to 22, God's thoughts are innumerable and so difficult to understand. And it brings David in Psalm 139 to the point in verse 23 and 24. Uh, that he, he calls out to the Lord. Again, he calls out to the Lord God. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. I'm standing before a holy, righteous, pure God, one who is just, one who uh, punishes sin, one who punishes sin. David cries out, lead me in the everlasting way. He understands that his salvation, his redemption comes only from God himself. And we may not ever know exactly why God does something, exactly when God is purposing to do something, or how God is going to work in our lives. We know only that God is able, and God does work. And God is able. And God has us in the palm of his hand. He, he is the holy, pure, sovereign Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to our God, but the things revealed to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of the law. This is why we need to understand and know what God has written in his word. God has determined and revealed to us his character, his nature, his actions amongst the, uh, the, the people of, of his own, those who do not know him. 
He's revealed many things. There's a lot of things that we don't know. I believe it says we're going to know, I see through a glass darkly. I, I, I can just only imagine, and this is the feeling that David conveys in Psalm 131. I, I don't know everything. The things of God are too great, for, too awesome for me to even consider to try to understand. I see through a glass darkly, God says in the New Testament. But one day, we'll be face to face. We'll have that glorified body and be able to stand in the very presence of God. Verse 1, we're to practice humility. We're not to be arrogant. We're not to consider ourselves above uh, anything, and we are to not uh, try to grasp the things of God that are unknown. Psalm 131, verse 2. Surely I've composed or stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. The word composed here means stilled. It means level or even or flat or smooth. Uh, David is determined to calm his heart, to smooth it out. Uh, whatever situation David is in, and I forgot to mention that uh, the thought of uh, a lot of the commentators was this was the period of time when David was fleeing from Saul. Obviously not a time where it was, would be necessarily a calming influence on you. But the determination is that David penned the psalm at that time. That he could sit and, and think about the Lord God, think about the ma maker of heaven and earth, about the one who has called his people to himself, and he would be still. He would be smooth. He would not allow his heart to be agitated by the things that he just considered in verse 1. He wouldn't be proud. He wouldn't have his heart lifted up. He wouldn't look down on other people. He wouldn't be agitated by circumstances in his life. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And we know from uh, verses 1 to 9 of Psalm 46 that uh, God is our refuge, he's our strength, and he's our ever-present help in times of trouble. David knew these things. Whether they had been penned before David in this Psalm 131 doesn't matter. David understood the thoughts of God. He had a heart after God, a desire to serve him and know him. David quiets his soul with thoughts of a sovereign God. David says he has quieted his soul. You know, we need to learn how to quiet our soul, thinking of the Lord God as well. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, we're not to be anxious about anything that's going on in our lives. We're not to be anxious about anything it's hard to do God tells us do it it's not a request and be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ we are to be quieted as David was quieted in his soul, understanding that there's nothing to be anxious about in this world, knowing that we are God's own, that he is sovereign, that he is all-powerful, he's all-present. We're to rely on him. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, uh, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll calm your soul. I will give you stillness in your heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. We have a great, great example in Jesus Christ to be humble in heart before a saving Lord and God. 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. David quiets his soul, understanding that there is peace with God by God's redeeming grace. And that grace, that redemption is found in Jesus, the great Redeemer, the Savior. We are to practice humility. We're to be contented. We're to have a still and a quiet soul. It says, uh, David, that he has a heart that is like a weaned child. Now, this is a difficult one. Uh, however, if you look at uh, a child that's not weaned, that is uh, constantly looking at uh, uh, self-gratification and I want what I want and I want it now and somebody better give it to me. Or... There is thrashing of arms and thrashing of legs and screaming and yelling and crying until the child is given the desires of his heart, the nutrition that he needs from the mother. This is not what a, a, a weaned child is like. A weaned child has already passed through that phase of understanding the mother is always going to be there. The food is always going to be given. The, the nurturing and the safety and the security will be there. I have, uh, I have a picture in my mind of being a, I don't know if it actually happened or I just have this picture in my mind of sitting on a back porch one time with my wife, my wife here and I'm here, and one of our children runs through the yard, falls down, immediately feels that they've been hurt beyond repair, and s jumps up and starts running to the porch. I have my hands open waiting f for the child to rush into my arms and there he goes. He knows he can be comforted. He has a place of security and protection and safety. He finds that being close to the heart of the mother. That's a discouraging thing for a father, I have to tell you. That's, <laughs> the desire is there. The desire is there. You know, this is what David is understanding, that when he is close to the heart of God, he is secure, he's comforted, he's protected, he finds peace and rest for his soul. Like a weaned child. Psalm 131 verse 3 says, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. David uh, goes beyond thinking of the, the Lord and his own personal relationship to him and extends it to the nation of Israel and said, Israel, you as a nation, you should, need, you should remember these things. There is hope in God. I would probably like to read that. There is only hope in God. And this is not a hope as in I hope that something happens that's to my benefit and my good. This is a waiting and expectation of what God is going to perform. Uh, again, he's looking at Yahweh, the loyal, loving, covenant-keeping God of Israel. Uh, there, you know, we can look back at the Abrahamic covenant. We can look at the Davidic covenant. God has promised Israel good things. He has promised to be the God of his people, Israel. There's a, in verse, uh, let me see, Psalm 130, in verse 7, it says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. Same phraseology. So it's, For with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. We find our redemption, as uh, David did, and as he called the nation of Israel to do, to look to the Lord God for the redemption that he provides. Uh, we in our sin and our sinful condition are not able to save ourselves. There's nothing we can offer to God in what we have done and the works that we do. There's no great things we can present to the Lord and say, look what I've done. And Jesus has an answer for people who do that. Depart from me, I never knew you. We are to have, be seeking after God's heart our desire is to be close to him, to understand him, to know his word, to dwell in it, to abide in him forever. Uh, not just in uh, situations that you find yourself day to day. 
but we know, we wait expectantly, understanding that God saves. He is saved through Jesus Christ, his son. And David's greater descendant was guaranteed to be ruling over his kingdom forever. And that was Jesus Christ. Uh, we see that in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The government's going to rest on his shoulders. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom. It will be under Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 19, you're not there yet, are you, brother? No, I'm not. Luke 19, verse 10 says, It was Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. That's us. It was, it was the nation of Israel. It was David himself understanding the scriptures to tell him that there was a need for a redeemer. The one who would seek and save his people from their sins. It was declared to Mary, uh, even before Jesus was born, that he was the one who was to save his people from their sin. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, the people of God, Israel. Psalm 131, David writing to them, wants them to remember the benefits of God and to understand that their, their place before God is not to be proud, not to be arrogant, and not to try to understand or believe that they can understand every difficult or great thing that the Lord has done. But they're to be comforted by God's word, understanding God is a, a redeemer God, a saving God. Uh, they need to remember his uh, covenant to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, he, he's going to make uh, Abraham a great nation. It was going to be the nation of Israel. It's going to have peoples in it uh, like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. It came to pass. God's people were going to be blessed in this world. Not only God's people Israel. But the whole world was to be blessed through Abraham. And they would remember this covenant of God. In the Davidic covenant, David was uh, guaranteed a descendant who would rule on his throne forever. That's Psalm 89, verses 1 to 4. The Lord God has made many promises, given many testimonies, given covenants to his people. And they're to remember. We are to remember all that the Lord has done and all that the Lord continues to do on our behalf. We're to be in his word, seeking to understand him more and more. We, we need to be in the word so that the things that he's revealed to us, we can understand, we can put into practice, we can, we can have a sanctified life as he leads and guides us through the spirit. David says, Israel, hope in the Lord. Wait expectantly for what God has promised from now and forever. And the people of God, they both uh, Israel, God's special people, and are all that he has called to salvation through Jesus Christ. We're to glorify him from this time and forevermore. One of the commentators, and I'm ending early, I'm surprised at myself. One of the commentators said that he was driving uh, through the, the, his hometown. He saw a billboard that was constructed, made him think of this psalm. You may or may not think so, but I, it's cute. The commentator saw the billboard, and it says, Good morning. This is God. I will be handling all of your problems today. I will not need your help. So relax. Be calm. Have a great day. The thoughts that we get from the Psalm 131 of David is one of being a humble, not a proud, not an arrogant person of the Lord. One that God has called to himself and one that we find comfort and solace and care and protection, security, salvation if we are close to him and like a, a weaned child I have this picture again in my mind of one of our young children uh, able to walk but not very old 
and my wife holding him on her chest. And that child is so contented. So, and I can't help, the picture that comes to my mind is that child is near the heart of the one that they feel secure with and calm with. We need to be close to the heart of God. And God has revealed his heart in his word. Be humble. Don't be arrogant. Our hope is in the Lord now and forevermore. That's my thoughts on Psalm 131. That took me almost the whole time. There's so many verses. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then if you have questions or thoughts or comments you'd like to make, we'll do that. Father, we thank you for a psalm of David. Uh, that, Father, uh, you are that holy and righteous and pure God, the one that we will stand before one day, and it is only by grace through Jesus Christ that we will be able to stand there dressed in a righteousness that is not our own, but is that of Jesus Christ. Father, you've redeemed us, you've saved us from the pit. Father, you've set us on a path. We are to walk in a sanctified manner led by your spirit. And we are so grateful, Father, and humbled before you. All that we have, all that we are, is because you have given, you have provided. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.